Hi, everybody. I'm Suzette Martinez Standring, and welcome to It's All Right with Suzette, a half hour show on the craft of writing. And today we have a very special guest, Bob Halloran, sports anchor for um, Sports Center 5, an ABC affiliate near Boston here. And he's had a long, distinguished career in sports reporting. Um, he's the recipient of, a New of the New England Emmy Award and two honors from the Associated Press. He's also an author, and um, his, um, one of his very well known books is is Irish Thunder, The Hard Life and Times of Mickey Ward, and he served as the technical consultant on the Oscar-nominated movie The Fighter, which starred uh, Mark Wahlberg and Christian Bale. And today, he's going to talk about his, ver his newest work, um, very fascinating book. It's just been released this past September called Impact Statement, A Family's Fight for Justice Against Whitey Bulger, Stephen Flemmy, and the FBI. So I'm really anxious to talk to you about it, and we're very anxious to hear all about your experiences. Bob, welcome. Well, thank you very much. Good to be here. So tell me, tell me about this book that you've written. Well, it was uh, an introduction uh, from my agent to uh, Steve Davis, who lives here in Milton, and his uh, sister Debbie Davis was one of the victims of Steve Flemmy and or Whitey Bulger. That question still hasn't fully been answered yet. And um, they were talking about uh, having a book written, and uh, my name came up as the potential author. And it was, it was nice that I got to meet with Steve first because I was very pleased that um, he and I kind of had the same idea and vision for it. Uh, he wanted something that would memorialize his sister, you know, uh, so that people would remember that there was a human being um, who walked this earth that was uh, taken from us um, through the violence of Bulger and Flemmy. And I wanted to make sure that people recognized that instead of being fascinated by the Bulger story and using that number 19 like it didn't mean anything, 19 victims and stuff. And so I wanted people to have an emotional attachment to uh, at least one of the victims. And uh, I set out to do that. And in the process of the writing, I found it interesting that I was defending Debbie and explaining her story uh, and also revealing Steve Davis's life and I think he became even a more sympathetic character throughout the course of, of the writing of the book. Um, you know, for people who may not know, it's hard to imagine, but you know, can you talk a little bit about that horrific um, murder that uh, was done on Debbie? Davis. That is one of the things that uh, when I go out and uh, speak about the book, I don't know if the audience has all the details, right. uh, so thanks for asking that. But uh, uh, Debbie Davis uh, was 17 years old when she met Steve Flemmy and she was working behind the counter of a jewelry store and he walked in, started flirting with her and despite the fact that he was, I think, 42 years old at the time, they started dating. and. Um, he put her up in an apartment and got her cars and jewelry and things, and they dated for uh, seven, eight years. And then the story, there's a couple of different mm -hmm. theories. Either she found out that he and, Fl he and Bulger were informants, uh, or he was jealous because she was about to leave him for another man that she had met on a cruise in Mexico. And uh, so he, he, Steve Flemmy lured her to his parents' house in South Boston, where the story that Flemmy tells uh, Bulger jumped out, strangled her, killed her. Flemmy ripped her teeth out and wrapped her up in tarp and brought her to um, Neponset River and uh, buried her there uh, under the bridge. So in trial, uh, they were trying to figure out who did it, and uh, the jury came back with a no finding. So Steve Davis and I have actually argued about this before because mm -hmm. he thinks that Bulger did it, and he has a, a very valid um, theory behind that. And I think that Flemmy did it, and uh, I'm not exactly sure what the jury decided in that whole thing, because uh, if even if Flemmy did it, there was reason to believe that the jury could find Bulger guilty of it because he would be a co-conspirator in all the things that the Winter Hill Gang was involved in. But they must have determined that uh, the killing of a girlfriend was not part of that criminal organization. So. Um, her, her case was uh, with a no finding, and so Steve didn't even get any kind of closure on that. You know, it's just horrific. And I was wondering, you know, um, you say that they contacted you. Mm -hmm. um, the perspective is, is, is a, a very unique one, because there, aren't a lot, there are a lot of books right now being written about Whitey Bulger, yeah. but not 
another book from the perspective of a victim's family. Yeah, that's very, that was important to me because when we talked about in that first meeting, I said, how many Bulger books are there already? And there's how many more going to come out of trial? I sat in the media overflow room uh, during the Bulger trial throughout the course of the summer, and I said, okay, there's a book right there, and she's writing a book, and he's writing a book, and they're all going to come out with books. Uh, and I didn't. W and I tell people this is not another Bulger book. Uh, I do mm -hmm. not go into the details of his crimes that are uh, uh, chronicled in several other books. Uh, it's really about the Debbie Davis family, Debbie and Steve, and their childhood and their parents and the dysfunctionality of that. And we learn about De Debbie's relationship with Flemmy. That's basically the first third of the book. And then we get into um, after Debbie has uh, disappeared, her body isn't found for 20 years. Um, when it is found, the family sues the federal government and wins, and so that trial is, is explained and the corruption of the FBI is exposed through that case. And then the third part of the book is the Bulger trial. But I don't get into a lot of the details that are in the trial every day, every mm -hmm. bookmaker, every drug dealer, every extortion right. uh, crime. If it doesn't somehow pull back to Debbie Davis's story, that is my focus throughout. So yes, there's a murder of a Richard Castucci um, that it suggested um, uh, laid the groundwork for Bulger and Flemmy to be allowed uh, to run loose by the FBI because the FBI knew about that murder and let it go. Therefore, it's theorized that that is what opened the, the door to all other murders, including Debbie. So I kind of explained that. But a lot of the other things that were going on in uh, Bulger's life and his tale and time in prison or uh, his time on the run, that's not what I'm doing here. Mine mm -hmm. is much more about the Davis family culminating with the Bulger trial and the verdict. You know, earlier you were talking about how um, many people were unsympathetic to Stephen Davis mm -hmm. because of his past involvement with, with the, uh, the Winter Hill gang. And, you know, you were saying that there was a lot of blaming of the mm -hmm. victim, like, mm -hmm. you know, as you say, what, as people were telling you, what do you expect? So, you know, how does that make you feel and what message did you want to send to people who feel that, well, you know, you reap as you sow. I was angered uh, throughout the process um, of people, uh, angry, angry with people who were blaming the victim. It's like, yeah, Debbie Davis um, found an opportunity to live a better lifestyle with a gangster. Of course she knew what he was doing if she didn't know the specifics of it. Of course her mother and brothers and sisters also knew what was going on here. Um, but at what point is she responsible for her own murder? I mean, right. at some point, Bulger and Flemmy, I mean, she dated the guy for eight years. Steve will tell you that um, he actually thought that Flemmy loved her in his own way, mm -hmm. um, and that that's one of the reasons he doesn't think that Flemmy could have killed her. I, of course, argue with Steve, okay, you say he loved her and couldn't kill her, but he ripped her teeth out and buried her <laughs> under a bridge. I mean, I'm not exactly sure where you can draw those lines. Uh, and so, and I felt that way about Steve too, because, pun intended, I guess, uh, his life is now an open book. He really does lay it out on the line and tells you about his uh, upbringing and his abusive father, and he was pulled out of school in sixth grade to work at the family gas station, kicked out of the house at 15, lost several different uh, siblings, including his father, somehow or another related to Flemmy and Bulger. Uh, so that's always going on. And um, so I think at some point or another we learn to be a little bit more sympathetic uh, towards Steve, and hopefully that's a message that I can get across there is that don't blame the guy. You can judge whatever you want, however you want to judge that he sold drugs, uh, Steve this is, that um, he spent some time in jail for um, theft and burglary. Uh, but he's a family man, loves his wife, mm -hmm. living here in Milton for a long time, and I don't think that uh, the judgment of this 15 to 25 year old Steve Davis has to be an overriding thought as people are reading the book. You know, read it, find out about the life that uh, he was forced into, and then decide if you want, still want to make those judgments. And I think that's what makes your book so interesting, the fact that you are able, you were able to talk to Steve Davis and get a lot of details mm -hmm. about his childhood, his personal life, his, you know, his relationship with his murdered sister and, and things like that. Things that, you know, we know about the brutal death, you know, and we, and we hear so much, you know, repeated in the news, but you really got in there 
into the very personal space of family and relationship, and your book is uncovers and reveals a lot of the things. That's what I like to let people know. I mean, I don't want to um, just pat myself on the back or brag a lot about the book, but people should be aware that at least 95% of this is brand new, that they're not aware of these stories that I'm telling, that it is not a Bulger Flemmy book, um, that the details that I'm able to um, put out there through the depositions and the, and the trial transcripts of the things that were not covered um, by, the, by the mass media um, and about Debbie's personal relationship with Flemmy that her sisters yes. and Steve were able to tell me about. Um, and so if you're interested in that story, it's new to you. It's not like the same old yes. thing. And then even the trial um, is new. They, that only just happened. So, uh, you know, like I said to you, that I, if it didn't bring itself back to Debbie Davis, then I didn't really pay that much attention to it. But there were highlights during the course of the trial when you know John Morris and is, is John Morris is apologizing to the Donahues, or when Flemmy and Bulger bark at each other, when Steve Davis stands up and yells at Steve Flemmy. Right. Um, yes, I put those in the book. Yes, <laughs> those are they were t they were too <laughs> interesting um, uh, to leave out. But other than that, the stories of these uh, bookmakers and the other characters, uh, I did not get involved in. And, you know, we're going to take a short break, and when we return, we're going to talk more with Bob Halloran about his new book, Impact Statement, A Family's Fight for Justice Against Whitey Bulger, Stephen, um, Stephen Fleming, and the FBI. So stay tuned, and we're going to get some, inf I hope to get some information that is not widely known okay. from your book. See you in a bit. Welcome back to It's All Right with Suzette, and we're here with Bob Halloran, and we're going to be getting some juicy information about his new book um, regarding um, Debbie Davis and, and her brother Stephen Davis uh, and the whole Whitey Bulger ordeal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I really love about your new book is that it touches on questionable people. Yeah. You know, it, I mean, m murder, death, whenever it happens to anyone is really tragic. You know, and it's very tragic when it happens to innocent people. But, you know, and this is no less tragic. However, you know, it brings up the controversy of the people's character and involvement and, you know, all those kind of things that people didn't know about and that mm -hmm. when you hear about it, it's easy to judge and dismiss, saying, well, what did you expect? But, you know, you mention that you learned so much about this family that humanizes them mm -hmm. and that made you very empathetic to the ordeal that they went through. So could you kind of share some of those things that you learned? Well, one of the first things I learned about Debbie was that uh, she was married when she was 16. Which I didn't know people were doing that in the, in the 70s. Um, I thought that was like, you know, yesteryear. But she was married and divorced by the time she met Steve Fleming. In fact, Fleming helped pay for the divorce to finalize it. Um, and so, and I'd asked Steve, I said, what the heck was going on? I mean, your parents just said fine with that? And there was very little structure in the household, um, mm -hmm. and people were trying to get out of the house. And mm -hmm. uh, at the yeah. age of 15, Steve was essentially thrown out of the house, and Debbie tr also tried to leave um, by getting divorced, and then uh, getting married, and then hanging out with Steve Flemmy. And there wasn't a lot of money, uh, and so these were opportunities for these poor people, uneducated, um, in order to you know, make their way in the world. This is where they ended up selling drugs uh, and connecting themselves to Steve Flemmy, and that brought upon an awful lot of tragedy. And so that is for people to judge, well, they brought it on themselves, or, uh, you know, you can sort of understand why they make some of the choices that they would make, because if, if Debbie Davis left Steve Flemmy, where does she go? What does she do? Um, and so, well, mm -hmm. she's involved in this bad guy. But when, one of the reasons we named it Impact Statement is because um, <clears throat> Steve's father, Ed Davis, 
didn't want Debbie dating Flemmy. So when Flemmy gets her a new car, he mm -hmm. takes a sledgehammer to it and beats the heck out of the car. The father did. Yes, and Flemmy says, if that wasn't your father, he'd be a dead man. Well, six months later, Ed Davis was found uh, drowned in uh, Marina Bay. And no autopsy was done, but the family is a little suspicious. Then Steve tells me about his brother Ronnie, who stands up at a wedding and insults the mafia, gets beaten up for it, retaliates. Then he goes to jail on a different offense. And while he's in jail, he's stabbed 23 times and murdered. And Steve thinks that Flemmy either okayed it or ordered it. And that came out in the Bulger trial that, yeah, that's basically it. Then after Debbie Davis disappeared, um, her younger sister, Michelle, um, who is about 16, 17 years old now, takes up with Flemmy, who's 50 years old now. And uh, ultimately... So he gets involved with her sister yeah. at the same time he's involved with... Well, well, he's pretending that he's looking for Debbie Davis, but she's already dead. Right. And then Michelle, uh, later in her life, dies of a uh, drug overdose. So you could see that there's either a direct or indirect result for Ed, Michelle, Ronnie, and Debbie, um, four deaths uh, that go right back to Bulger and or Flemmy. Um, wow. And that's, you know, that's an, a heavy impact on a family uh, that, yeah, they were connected to this uh organization this you know but it was uh, one I don't know that you'd expect that much tragedy to come out of it simply because you know one guy is off on the side selling right. drugs and one girl is dating uh, the gangster mm -hmm. how did Stephen Davis manage to get out of working with them well he never did he was selling drugs on his own uh -huh. and um, with his brothers and um, it the book opens with a scene where uh, Bulger calls him to triple O's, calls Steve to triple O's, and orders him to pay uh, tribute or rent, and uh, they had such clever names for everything. And um, Steve says no, and so he has a gun in his mouth, chipped his tooth. Um, Whitey hands him a bullet that says, and you know, he says, "It's got your name on it," and all that, and all this theatrical. Like, you know, I don't think I don't even know if it stayed in the book, but one of the things I thought of Bulger right away was, "What a drama queen, this guy." <laughs> Of all the things that he, you can describe him as, I just got the impression when Steve told me the story about Triple O's that Bulger set the room up just right, just so, like he was some, you know... Uh, Psychopath? No, like, <laughs> like a woman throwing a Tupperware party. Oh. And he just wanted to have everything. So here's the body bag next to the desk, and here's the gun on the desk. Should I turn it this way? Should I turn it that way? Are the lights right? And, stuff? and he set it up just right, and then Steve sent up the stairs in pitch blackness, and there's... Whitey Bulger, you know, and he, I think he wow. thought he, his entire life he, he was in a movie. And so, and I reject all the lines that they attribute to him, you know, um, when uh, Paul and McGonagall is uh, buried at uh, Tenian Beach and Bulger famously um, says, you know, when the tide comes in, drink up, Paulie, you know, because right. he's on. It's like, I guarantee you he never said it. But they just, that's the legend that they like to pass on and attribute these things. I give Whitey Bulger zero credit for cleverness. I give him zero credit for courage. What a coward. I mean, of all, I mean, that's what I'm saying. People, a psychopath, serial killer, evil, vile, terrible man. Um, but yes. then there's these other words that also fit. I don't know that he, the man ever got into a fist fight. Every story that was ever told was him holding a gun and you don't have one. I mean, mm. and then he stood up in court. And, you know, sometimes when you're going to give a talk or something yes. like that, you might have that little bit of nervousness. And yes. it comes out a little breathy to begin with before you finally relax and talk to the crowd. Well, he stood up like a scolded schoolboy when it was finally his turn to say that, um, you know, he thought this was a, a sham and, and he didn't get to put on the trial that he wanted to because he was handcuffed from saying what he really wanted to say and, and putting on the proper defense. But he was all breathy and nervous and uh, like uh, just scared. It's like... What a feeble, frail, I don't know what he was when he was tough guy, but he was a gun-toting tough guy. That's all I know. So. Wow. And what was your, what was your initial um, impression of Stephen Davis? Mm. And by the time you were finished, what, what did you feel about him? You know, I, I talked to my wife about it every once in a while and that uh, Reagan phrase of trust but verify. And so when Steve tells me this first story about being a triple O's and all the rest, I'm going, is that really, did that really happen? I mean, I don't know if he's, because he, he talks like this and he's everything and he's got, the, you know, the big chest and the chains on and stuff. And I don't know what to make of him, if it's all bluster, if it's all like a, a characterization that he's putting forth. But during the trial, um, this uh, Michael Salamando, 
um, stood up on the, was on the stand and he told about how uh, Bulger extorted him at Triple O's and with the desk and the table and the body and the thing. I was like, wow, that's a very Same similar MO. story. Very similar story, enough to where it verified for me what Steve had told me. Uh, and then all the other stories he was telling um, were really not pleasant stories about his own childhood and things that, uh, you know, I didn't feel there was any motivation for him to lie about those types of things when he says that his father made him wear a dress because he had long hair and he was going to ridicule him and stuff. And when he tells the story about how he wanted to kill his father and he stood over the bed while the father was drunk and passed out and he had a knife in his hand and was thinking about killing him, and the father wakes up and beats him up and sends him out. That was kind of like the last day in that house. But, um, you know... Those stories, I assume, are true. Wow. Well, you know, in the writing process, you went to the trial. You mm -hmm. were next to him throughout the entire yeah. trial, and you had to talk to all these people. What was it like being immersed in this world? Yeah, um, you know, because I, I met so many different people, mm -hmm. you know, some of the other victims' families as well. The Donahues are very nice people. Uh, I met Stephen Rakes and became friendly with him, and that was a stunning day. Um, but... You know, there were pl there's plenty of days during the course of a trial that seem a little more boring than others when mm -hmm. the forensic pathologist is up there and you're looking at uh, shots of, um, you know, grave sites and uh, skulls and bones and whatnot. And on those days, I just did a lot of writing. I just worked while I was there. Uh, but the rest of the trial truly was fascinating. There were an awful lot of um, characters who got up there. And, yeah, they definitely broke the law and did other things, but they had stories to tell and personalities and there was some levity from time to time. And um, so, uh, you know, you see Martirano on the stand and you go, really? You're the guy who killed that many people? You don't seem that way, you, you know? Um, Kevin Weeks, mm. you know, he could be anybody, you know? But he's mm -hmm. got this background. And, um, you know, that's one thing about that. I always tell people during the course of the trial that the only... Uh, people who did a good job. I think the judge did a good job. I think the jury did a good job. I think the defense did a lousy job and the prosecution wasn't any better. Really? You know, the defense didn't even try to defend him, really. You know, they kept trying to pick every uh, witness apart with a lie or something, but it would, it would be a, a lie that they found. Because they all, all these guys have testified like 23 times right. in different trials. So, well, in this trial, you said it was beige and now you're telling us <sighs> it was white or cream colored. It's like that, it's almost that minute. And um, it just seemed ridiculous. And then the prosecution, I look at them, I go, man, Whitey Bulger was the defendant. You can't bat a thousand on that. You got seven not guilties, you know, because they didn't even try very hard to mm -hmm. um, prove those cases. There'd be a story of a guy um, sitting in a car at a red light and a machine gun bullet fire starts riddling the car and two people in the car die and the guy tells the story. But there, he's not asked if he saw who did it and he doesn't volunteer it, and so we don't know for a fact that Bulger was there. There's no ever other evidence. So, okay, that was an interesting, heartfelt, you know, sad story, tragic, uh, but it didn't prove anything. So, and I think the jury did an excellent job of kind of going, well, we can't prove that he did it. We can't say guilty on that. And I also think that they did a good job on Debbie Davis's. I mean, it really was questionable. That, um, Deborah Hussey killed in a very similar manner, right. um, but Kevin Weeks was there, so it's at least one more corroboration. Uh, yes. In the Deborah Davis uh, story, it's only Flemmy saying that this is what happened, and Flemmy just can't be counted on to tell the truth. So, You know, in your interviews with all these different sometimes questionable people. You know, what always fascinates me is they want to tell you their story mm -hmm. and they want to tell you their version of the story. Right. So how do you figure out or how do you get them or persuade them to tell a, tell, to reveal something that is patently unfavorable to them, yeah. or do they do that? It's one of my favorite parts about being an author, yes. really. I don't know if that's supposed to be one of my favorite parts, but it is, because in television, uh, I'm one of 27 microphones that mm -hmm. get thrown into Tom Brady's face, and maybe you ask a question, but you certainly don't get a follow-up, you don't get to challenge right. anything. Uh, but w when you're writing, you're spending an awful lot of time with these people. You get hours, you get follow-ups, a whole bit. And uh, so... When somebody tells you a story and it doesn't seem to ring true, you can go back to it and ask some follow-up questions, and you can be very direct about it. Yes. Um, I don't have no, none of these people have to like me. So if I ask a question that ups, that upsets them, that challenges, you know, you're calling me a liar. And it's like, 
Mm, maybe I am, um, but so you, if you want to, you can prove that you're not. Probably not the first time. But right, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's probably not the worst thing you've ever been called. Um, but it gives me an opportunity to challenge and to argue and uh, to make people, you know, explain themselves. Sometimes that's on details about what right. was or, or what did or didn't happen about something, and other times it's just about philosophy and um, the way they perceive the world. If I have a moment, uh, one of the things I just thought was remarkable was when I talked with Eileen. Davis, Steve and Debbie's sister, and uh, Debbie was saying to her that she was thinking of leaving Fleming, and Eileen was like, yeah, you should go, and he, Debbie says, well, I really can't because Fleming's told me that if I leave him, he's going to kill each one of my siblings one at a time. And Eileen said, uh, well, you should go anyway because after he kills one or two of us, they'll catch him and the, and the rest of us will be okay. Now, is that how you <laughs> would react? I mean, isn't that the most bizarre way of... It? Truly but, a dysfunctional family. But that's a, you know, whatever, you know, things happened that's in really her odd. life that led her to that right. way of thinking, exactly. I found fascinating. And so now I'm going to ask her some follow-up questions about, really, what, huh? And so that kind of gets revealed in uh, some... Uh, so you can put some layers out there into books and allow readers to learn about other people you know I mean I didn't know anything about Lowell and Mickey Ward and then breakdown I'm walking through the city of Chelsea in an, in an environment that I'm not familiar with with kids who are different than the kids that are living in Milton uh, with mm -hmm. the experiences mm -hmm. that they have to go through um, and now this one as well you know so uh, it opens up doors for me um, hopefully it opens my eyes to things and uh, then hopefully I can share that with people. Well I think you have a real talent for getting into the personal details and shining a light on the difference between how many people perceive things mm -hmm. and how some people can have what we, you would almost say kind of this crazy um, way of thinking or this crazy rationale, but you can get readers to understand mm -hmm. where that's coming from. Well, we're a product of our experiences. That's very true. And so if you can share other people's experiences, um, you know, reading books or uh, uh, watching television or something like that, then maybe you can get a little bit better understanding as to how they think and why they act the way they do. Uh, and hopefully that uh, is a way of connecting people at least a little bit. And Bob, how do we buy your book? Oh, well, um, <laughs> I have a whole bunch of copies, but... Um, oh, uh, I'm sure people would love yeah. to reach you personally for this. Yeah, they're in the... Uh, I do have a, lot, a list of speaking engagements, so you can check out oh, Impact do. Statement on Facebook um, uh, and also my Twitter. I tell people when I'm going to be at certain locations. But it's on Amazon.com. It's in local bookstores. Uh, hopefully it's, um, you know, selling out and then being replaced. That's the big plan. Oh, I'm sure it will. Impact statement, A Family's Fight for Justice Against Whitey Bulger, Stephen Fleming, and the FBI, available on Amazon. And if you check out the Impact Statement um, Facebook page, you'll be able to find out where Bob Halloran is speaking next. Where are you talking next? Um, uh, next week, as a matter of fact, November 14th, I'll be at the Independence Mall in Kingston, uh, True Crime Writers uh, Night, uh, hosted by Casey Sherman, and uh, I'll just be one of the uh, panel m members. Well, that's great. Yeah. That's great. I wish we had more time because there's so much more I'd love to know, and I know that everyone else would love to hear all kinds of things. Just really quickly, did the Davis family grow up in Milton? Uh, no, they grew up more in Brookline than anywhere else. Oh. A little bit all over the place okay. in Dorchester and then into Brookline. That's where the gas station was that I the see. father owned and operated. And is he going to be, is Stephen Davis going to be accompanying you on some of these? He's going to an awful lot of the uh, speaking yes. engagements with me. Because I know Mickey me. Ward did that with you yeah, on your other and, tour. Yeah, and Steve is coming out to as many as he can. Okay. And, uh, you know, so I give the book presentation, talk about a lot of things, and then when people are asking questions, they have a lot for Steve, and he stands up and is very open, very honest, and very eloquent. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Bob. Thanks. I really appreciate you being on the show, and I hope everyone runs out to get Impact Statement. I think it's a wonderful book in that you can find out so many um, details and information and stories that are not widely known about the Whitey Bulger ordeal and what the effect it had on this family. So thank you again, yeah. and we'll catch you the next time on It's All Right with Suzette.